we get a sailboat Chasing down the sunset as we float Round and round the globe This is Margarita, the normal one in a not quite normal marriage. And this is Peter, he's a little bit different, which keeps me on my toes. Together we are on an adventure that didn't work out as planned, but we are fighting back, so come join us! Here's the new and improved list from the end of last week's episode. As you can see, some things are done, so it's not quite hopeless. But we've only got 10 days to go, so let's stop gabbing and let's get straight into it. First, the bottom job. So after leaving the bottom to dry out for a few days, probably about six or seven, I sealed all the holes with straight epoxy and I bogged a few. And let's continue. Hey, I filled up all of the holes. Well, most of them, I can see by the shadows now that I've missed a few. Use a very, very flexible metal um, tool like this. It's the best thing. If you're gonna do it, at least use vinyl ester. It's way more stickier than polyester, but the best is epoxy. I would have preferred to use phenolic microspheres for underwater, but I couldn't get them. Yeah, Marguerite is not too happy with me. I'm a bit of a messer when I've got jobs. Well, I can't complete a job because I usually run into an obstacle and I go on another one until we get a taxi and down and then we can complete a job. So, it's actually an early one night. Well, 6.30 and I'm finishing up. Oh, baby. Bugger, I forgot one job outside. This is a crack resulting from the chain plate underneath. I don't want any water to get inside and cause corrosion, so we remove the brittle filler and fill it with a far superior epoxy mix. Good morning! They're going to upgrade this room. They need this room for storage, so we're gonna go to a bigger room with an actual kitchen. Let's go check it out. So here we have the kitchen. Fridge and two beds and more space to put all our stuff. And this is gonna how it's gonna look. Chana, this is the afterwards. Another job that we just added into the list. We're taking the um, the wallpaper from the the berth on the back. That's usually where we sleep when we are doing like passages or if the weather is a bit rough. Uh, Peter sleeps here and I sleep in the couch or vice versa. But this is a pure sauna. Lose weight is top stuff. But look, it's all wet. It's like temp again. This is like this wallpaper. Almost. We just can get rid of it with a chisel. If we take it, it just wrecks. I'm down to the last piece of wallpaper and then it's all done. Look at this. So, good night guys! Okay, let's see how far this prop blade is bent. I got a peg. This is the official measuring device, or one of the official measuring devices on this boat. Okay, that easily clears that blade. Easily clears that blade. But this blade 
it hits. So this one's been pushed back. We tried to buy a prop in Colombia, but the price was bloody ridiculous and way outside our current budget. But we needed a backup, so I was forced to fix my old one. Manfred also had the same quality measuring devices lying around too, so I borrowed his. No, no, too high tech for me. This is my assistant who doesn't want to be filmed. No. Almost there. A few more taps and we'll be there. And no thanks, Santa Claus. I don't want to work for you. I'm holding out for NASA. You have it really nice. No. Okay, done. The spline sleeve in here is held by pressure onto the propeller by a sacrificial rubber sleeve. And due to the impact, the rubber has been damaged and the spline sleeve has been knocked off centre. First I'm going to have to re-centre this and then I'm going to drill and tap some stainless steel bolts through these fin supports to fix the spline sleeve back to the prop. This re-centering of the spline sleeve is done to NASA specifications, as you can see. Some scrap material comes in handy, a sharpened welding rod, and an offcut of stainless. Okay, done. Now while the wedges are in place, we drill and tap. I'm of course using the best vertical drill press our money can buy. Make sure you drill far enough down the prop so you don't drill into the spline part of the sleeve. Just past halfway ought to do it. Use bolts of 5mm, don't go less. My extremely knowledgeable New Zealand friend Stuart on the boat Matador, he gave me this idea to do this and he used smaller bolts. But as soon as he gunned the motor they all sheared off. But he found that 5mm bolts worked a charm on his 10 horsepower. Now screw in the bolts until they just protrude through the spline sleeve. But don't go too far otherwise you won't be able to get the prop back onto the shaft. Now while I'm here, I may as well clean up the leading edge of the prop. Yeah, I know. NASA scientists out there, you're watching and you're picking up a few tips. You're welcome. You're welcome. This is the ultimate precision action showing completion. Looking up with the light. So it must be finished. If we ever use this prop, there is the possibility of damage to the gearbox since the rubber bush, which is the sacrificial part, has now been bypassed. But we need a backup. I'll just have to be very careful when we use it. Now before we cut off the heads of the bolts, make sure you can get the damn prop on the shaft. It fits easy peasy, so I haven't screwed the bolts in too far, but I will tweak them in just a bit more. Now I take a look and remember how far the bolts protrude on the inside, remove them, epoxy them up, and then reinstall, and then a final check before the epoxy sets. Now you cut the heads off. And it's almost new, except for the dings. <laughs> Manfred was laughing too much and making comments, and interrupting the high quality production as you know. And I was just going to say something when a couple of things flashed through my mind. Okay, a different strategy is required. I'm here in Manfred's... Oh, I'm here, I'm still filming. Shut up Manfred, far out, Jesus. Manfred thinks this is his workshop. This is Manfred's workshop. I am so lucky for him to take me under his wing. Offers advice, tells me how to do things, and because he's been sailing for 30... Advice. No, no, I did the last time, I just did it in a different order. Um, he's been sailing for 30 years, he doesn't want to go on camera because he's a bit camera shy. Yes. But he's happy to lend me some of his gear. And to that, I thank you, Manfred. My hat is off to you. Kind sir. Mr. Stuntman spoke. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to lift up my feet here, uh, folks, because it's getting pretty deep around here. Look. Get up. 
Oh, he's on film. I also gouged out some of the rubber sleeve at the back and filled the void with epoxy. NASA scientists, I'll be expecting your job offers soon. Now I ought to point out that these videos are not completely chronological because if that was the case they'd be way too fragmented because for example sometimes I'd do an hour on the bottom and then whilst it was setting or whilst I was waiting for the sun to come up on the side to uh, heat up the side to uh, burn off all the moisture I'd go do another job. So I put them together as best uh, as I could just so you get a, an idea of how the job progressed. Um, so don't go, oh hang on, that looks a bit different, or that was, well, so it's not quite chronological. The other thing I should point out, uh, or you probably uh, would criticise me on, is you're saying, you might say, for example, just on the prop you just saw, you didn't have to do that in the hard stand, that's just wasting time, you should be working on the boat. Well in actual fact, there's a lot of downtime when you're waiting for paint to dry, the sides to dry, the bottom to dry out, and all the little gouges, little holes to completely dry out. So you need jobs to fill in some of the time, otherwise, well you've got nothing to do. So just bear that in mind, and less with the criticisms, okay? We're trying our best, and well, you know how good that is. Five more minutes, we're going to have security. We did have some cable across here that I made in Tampa, but <laughs> anyone could get through that. I'm just horrified by what happened with Sea Tramp and what could certainly have happened to us. I mean, the place that we stayed in Belize, my goodness, makes my skin crawl. And we heard later on that there were absolutely horrible things happening. I don't even want to mention. Um, but certainly robbery was one and there was a whole lot of gruesome other things so I think we were very very lucky um, this is this part of the world I had heard from um, one other cruiser that out of all the time I think it was the, um, the French people they did a bit of research on it um, out of all the Caribbean most of the um, crime is in Grenada and Panama with Panama having four times the share so, and we spent a long time there. I mean, we were lucky when I came in with Doug and Adam, we had the boat wide open. Um, I think the, probably the only thing that saved us is because the boat is, well, it hasn't got a good paint job and there's rust stains and it just looks like a boat that's, um, well, doesn't have much. And we didn't have much anyway, but still, um, even a chart plotter or a tablet is a lot to, you know, to poor people, so still. <clears throat> now just because we got these bars doesn't mean that we're secure. Any person can get through any defence on a boat. You can't build a boat unless it's a steel boat. You just can't do it. The only thing it's going to do is buy time, so it's going to buy time to get the flare guns, to get the, the bear spray, in our case we've got um, wasp spray, get the spear guns loaded, um, whatever we can get, we're going to get, and so I reckon this will buy five minutes of time, I mean if they were really keen and they had a big crowbar, god it would only take 30 seconds, but still 30 seconds is better than suddenly them jumping on top of you in bed and then doing god knows what, so it's just to buy time and just make it a little bit harder. I was thinking of actually buying a, uh, a, a cap gun or some gun, like a starter's pistol, but even then it's probably illegal in some of these countries, it's probably regarded as a firearm, but just something that makes a noise because if they're busily trying to get through the security bars and then I stick my hand up through the, um, the toilet hatch, which is only little, and just go bang, it's going to scare the shit out of them. And I think they're used to cruisers being passive. I mean, continually, people, cruisers are passive because governments have forced them to because they say you're not allowed to have weapons or if you do have weapons, you can declare it. And if you declare it, it makes it a big hassle. You've got to pay for the storage. You've got to pay for the transport. It's a big deal. And even then, they might say, oh, well, this is illegal. as a firearm here. You're going to jail. So um, they've made us passive. And because of that, all the crooks know. And they see this big boat. And compared to their... Um, Ninja salaries, we're rich people, and they go, well, shit, this is going to be ten thousand, and ten thousand dollars in electronics and gear is going to, it's like two or three years' work for them, so it's worth it. 
And if it's pa- if we're passive, then we're just gonna do it. But I don't think I can be passive. I, I just can't. I can't bear to have the no control. I mean, look, most of the situations where I'm in, where paragliding is beautiful, where you're not completely in control, but at least I know my enemy, you know? I'm not an enemy. I mean, I know what sharks are like. I'm not, no, I'm not too scared of them. <laughs> scared of spiders, though. Um, so, I think you... If you put up a bit of a fight, whether it's the screens and a flare gun or something like that, they're going to go too hard and jump off and just go to another boat. Like I had heard the story, there was one set of crooks, someone was watching them or something. They robbed the third boat. They came to the first boat and it was completely locked up. It was too hard. They went to the second boat, it was open, there was a dog that was barking. It wasn't even a big dog. They left that boat. Then they went to the third boat and they robbed it because it was open and there was no dog. So I think you make it difficult just a little bit, they're going to jump off. Anyway, he's hoping. Anyway, we've got three spear guns, two flare guns. I'm sure to do some damage with that. And then I'll sell my life dearly before I let anything happen, uh, bad happen to Margarita. So it's all going to be good. like a toddler. That's my full weight. And another padlock can go in here. I polished up the frame. Does it meet Madam Queen's approval? Still has some yellow stuff here, here. There's no pleasing some people. Sender. I can't get the bloody grinder in there. With your hands, we descend it. I love my wife, but she can be a real... All right, let's see it. And you can put a padlock here and you can put a false padlock here around here to buy time good morning we're about to go to our weekly grocery shopping at the local veggie market i know i know i'm wearing a proper shirt and it's bloody itchy i hate wearing clothes anyway three dollars and a 15 minute taxi ride later and we're at the bizzurto market Oh bugger, what are the chances of going down the shoe aisle first? And I wanted this to be a quick trip. Oh what a shame, they don't fit. The fish and meat area may shock people from more developed countries, because in the heat the food is just laying about. But we were mostly vegetarian in Colombia, so we had no nasty little surprises in the toilet department. The Brazorto market has almost every conceivable fruit and vegetable that South America provides. It is my piece of heaven after working so hard in the boatyard. In the Colombian heat, I believe you ought to hydrate not only with water, but with fruit as well. So we bought a lot, and it was cheap. About 10 or 20 times cheaper than it is in bloody Oz. We were told by some other cruisers that this market was a dangerous place, but I think they were crazy. I never ever felt threatened or in danger, and I was also filming too. In fact, everyone was friendly and helpful. I would like to say that I'm about as useful as a pack mule, which is basically my function at the market. But then this guy turned up and it all changed. Now I was completely useless. Ah, this is my favourite stall. Passion fruit for about 4 to $5 for a 10 kilo bag. That's right people, I have a lot of passion to recharge. And then Juan asked about the filming. Margarita told him we were YouTube stars and he was really, really impressed as you can see. 
Well, about as impressed as my single Chinese supporter who I lost because of my comment about Chinese working boots when I was barefoot. Ah, what are you going to do? We did it quite fast this time with the help of our carrier. Juan. Juan, that was, that was all of it. He carried all our stuff just for $1.20. How good is that? This is the best and, supermarket and, ever. And that was when we gave him a tip too. Yeah, because we... It's pretty good having hiring these guys to taking the trolley with everything because they always take us to the best deals and they would know exactly where to take us because the market is huge. You can get yourself lost. It's like a little city. Here are some tips for the market which we didn't actually put in the video in the car, which we should have. Okay, number one, do not go after it rains. It is a quagmire. And there's also some very enterprising young girls and boys who have these, um, you know, those pallets, those wooden pallets, and they'll put those across the laneways that are flooded and they will charge you to cross. It's not much, 15 or 20 cents, but there you go. And it's pretty disgusting. And the smell is, well, extraordinary. Also, find out the fresh days at the market. For example, when we were there, they were delivering Monday night, Wednesday night, and Friday night. So obviously you go Tuesday morning, Thursday morning, or Saturday morning. Now, if you're one of the unfortunate people that look like me, with my hair looking like it does, you will be instantly recognized as a gringo, and they will try to up the price a bit. But they'd see me, and I'd even hear quietly, Gringo, gringo. And they think, oh, here's an easy victim. And then I'd introduce Margarita and kapow! They were put in their place. I mean, Margarita would even argue with the devil. And I'd be feeling sorry for the devil sometimes too. <laughs>
After one year and a half of leaking inside salt and fresh water, we are replacing it for this new baby! I love shopping even if it's hardware store. Is it it's so shiny? It's gonna we have so many space to wash and have everything's gonna be great. I really don't have much room at all, but having big sinks made Margarita so happy I would have ripped out the wall. I didn't have a circular saw to do this job, but the on-site carpenter did it for six bucks. Now to clean it up and make it as smooth as possible, ready for the flow coat. Look at how tight this is, people. Only millimetres to spare and I have to squeeze the sink in anyway. But there was a problem. The sink wasn't sitting flat. I had to build up the bottom right hand corner with some epoxy and micro balls. There was only room for one tap in the corner and we needed an extra tap for salt water. So I had to put in a pipe at an angle. The first flow coat is already on, which I didn't film. Now I have to uh, resin that in and then I'll do a flow coat over the top. I know it looks bodgy, but you know the those uh, caravan shower hoses, they always jam up in the tiny little holes. So. I'm putting in a pipe. I did that on a long reef and it worked well. It just looks a bit bodgy, but as I said, a little bit of bodginess uh, just makes me feel at home. Okay, it's late in the day. I'm going to do the second coat of uh, epoxy flow coat. Um, I'm doing it late in the day because, well, I don't know if you can see it, Nick, but I'm sweating like a pig. And during the day, I'm liable to sweat in the job like I almost did yesterday. Um, it's pretty easy. Part A, part B, in this case it's one to one uh, epoxy. We need some white pigment. We need a paintbrush, a bowl, and a little blowtorch. This is the secret. Um, and you just simply liberally apply it. I'm not gonna film me mixing up the two parts of resin because I'm sure anyone can mix one to one. You grab enough pigment just by eye, making it just wide enough. In this case, probably about 50 grams. So, um, actually, sorry, scrub that, about 25 grams. So, I'll mix it up, and then I'll start filming and I'll show you the, uh, the hard part, which is using the blowtorch. Gravity does all the work for you here, people. Just apply a very generous layer, and it spreads out to a very smooth, level finish. By the way, the blue tape goes on the inside so as to create a pool, so the flow coat can go to all one level and not drip into the cupboard. There's a bubble. Gone. As soon as the blowtorch hits the bubble, it pops and the flow coat comes in to fill it up. It's so easy, even well, <laughs> even I can do it. Now whilst it's still soft, use your sharp blade because where you had the tape, it creeps up on the tape and you just take off that edge, otherwise if I leave it a bit longer, it's going to be glassy and then I'm going to have to sand it and then I'll probably stuff the surface that I've just made. So it's very easy, it's very easy. Here we have a generous bead of silicon around the sink. Clean up is with alcohol and a clean rag. Make sure you use a generous layer of silicon. It is true that most will have to be cleaned away, but the Drongo who installed my original sinks used so little silicon that in places the water just came through. Now that I've done the flow coat around the sink, Margarita wants everything flow coated including the toilet seat and the space around the oven bugger this place got so many layers it's got formica then it's got uh, wallpaper well glue then wallpaper then paint then wood and then gingerbread The sinks and the area around the oven took a lot of time. I almost don't like looking at the updated list anymore. Yes, here it is, and we've only got two days to go before the deadline. 
Join us next week to see if we can perform a miracle. If you like watching us, you can also follow us on our Instagram account and Facebook is exactly the same name, Sailing Into Freedom. And give us a like, subscribe if you haven't, and click the bell so you don't miss on any future video that's coming up. And don't forget to name drop people. We need all the help we can get to try and get to 140k. So on all the other ch sailing channels and RV channels and any adventure channels, say, oh, you should watch some Sailing Into Freedom episode. They're pretty good. That's right, people. Lie through your teeth. No, don't lie it. <laughs> oh, just lie a little bit. <laughs>